So thank you everybody um, who is joining us today. Um, We're talking about accurate customer data, a powerful tool for operational excellence. Um, my name is Ashley McCreary and I'm a marketing coordinator here at Service Objects. Um, I'll be helping Rob answer out throughout this webinar. This webinar should only take about 30 to 45 minutes. We will have um, a Q&A section at the end, but please feel free to put your questions in in the chat box below. Um, and we will get to those questions uh, at the end of the webinar. So this is where I hand it off to Rob Manser. Thanks, Ash, and thanks everyone for joining us today. As Ashley mentioned, we're gonna talk about customer data validation and how it supports operational efficiencies and excellence. Um, so I put together a short agenda. Um, well, today we're gonna just talk about, uh, briefly talk about sort of what we're seeing as the financial landscape. Or, you know, Forbes has an interesting article out about it and really just some of the challenges that are coming um, now, that we're seeing now and are coming in the, in the, in the coming year here. Um, and then we'll talk about customer data validation, sort of how it works and how we can start to play into um, meeting some of the challenges in the financial landscape, um, specifically around creating some efficiencies and, um, and whatnot. Um, I believe Ashley has a, a quick poll that we'll sort of throw up in the middle of there just to get a, a sense from you guys uh, on customer data validation. And then after that, we'll dive into what some of the um, business efficiencies that, that we can that we have seen people use um, when they have accurate data. Um, and we'll talk about three examples in there. Um, and then we'll have the question and answers as Ashley talked about. So um, as I said, today we are seeing, you know, according to Ford, today's we are seeing really significant financial challenges coming up either now or coming in the, on the horizon. And they're really sort of connected to three or four main points. One is we are seeing an economic downturn sort of coupled with inflation. Um, and those um, those put real pressure on businesses, um, whether it's um, hiring or salaries or, you know, um, just sales um, growth. Um, we're really you're really looking at um, looking for ways to it, it make those more efficient. Um, and of course, um, because of that, um, in as well as um, because of that sort of financial pressure that we are all experiencing, and um, we're seeing increases in pride. There's just more of a, a sort of a, a drive to find ways to rip people off is the best way I can come up with it. Um, but um, and the other part that's happened in the last since, since pre-COVID really, but through COVID, um, what what Forbes is sort of acknowledging is customer expectations have changed. Um, contact rates and you know the if, um, the speed with which you get back to a customer um, uh, on a query or a shipment or any of those things, those expectations have shortened and changed quite a bit. Um, and so we want to find ways to meet those expectations as efficiently as possible. And then lastly, um, what, what we're really seeing now, and I, I think we're all experiencing is the um, at a regional, national, or even global level, we're just seeing expanding and really um, tightening privacy and data regulations coming up. And so to make sure that you're compliant with those or adhering to those um, regulations is, is a real challenge. And so you know your compliance teams, if you have one, um, are really being taxed. And so there's ways that we, um, customer data validation can really help meet, um, sort of meet the compliance officer somewhere along their, their path and help um, make it more efficient for them. So with that said, um, I really wanted to um, talk about customer data validation and what it is. Well, first and foremost, it's essential for businesses today. Um, it really just ensures that your data, your customer data is accurate and genuine and current. Um, and it's, it really focuses on the five core identity attributes of a customer. So name, address, phone, email, and device. And device is really um, uh, the shorthand for IP, if you will. Um, and those five data points, um, you may not collect all five of those for every customer, but any one of those five can give you some um, valuable insights into your customers. Um, and it's going to help facilitate some database-driven decisions and really create that operational excellence that we're going to talk about today. Um, so with that said, um, I thought I'd dive a little deeper into what customer data validation is. Um, it's really um, It really brings together a global authoritative data sets or customer data sets. And it's combined with a very sophisticated um, AI. Um, and those two put together um, will validate, correct, and then ultimately give you um, secondary um, data pieces that allow you to make a, um, a number of automated or largely automated decisions, but at the very least informed decisions. Um, and so we break this down into four layers. Um, and we'll just talk about each layer really quickly here. 
Um, and so the first layer is the, this fundamental integrity check. And really what this means is we're going to um, take the name or the address, the phone, the email device, or all of the above, and we're going to go um, bounce that against these this authoritative these authoritative data sets that we have. So that might be if you have a mailing address in the United States, we're going to you know we we have the United States Postal Service mail uh, address database at our at our um, disposal. If you're um, looking for phone number sort of validations, we have over 4,000 phone provider data sets, um, including Verizon, the big ones that you can think of. Um, or um, maybe it's email and we're looking for malicious or um, fraudulent email sort of patterns. And we can identify all of those in that integrity check. So the integrity check is really meant to um, it, um, check that the information provided is accurate. If it's not, um, where possible, we'll correct it. Um, that, that correction requires a lot of sophisticated um, intelligence to know should I change 132 Main Street to 123 Main Street because it doesn't exist, or did they mean 132 Main Street? There's a lot of um, sort of energy that goes into that or um, logic that goes into that. That's 20 years of our experience to do that. Um, but after we've ad identified and validated those points, we move on to this next level, which is called Augment and Extend. And in this step, what we're, we're doing is appending additional information to the record. So, in, you know, for example, going back to the, the mailing address, um, the USPS data set has a number of uh, secondary data points, like is the address deliverable? Is it a business or a residence? Um, all of those things might inform you um, on how you want to deliver the package or who you want to deliver the package with. Maybe you want to use a third party vendor because the USPS doesn't recognize it as a deliverable data point. In fact, there are over 15 million addresses in the United States alone that are not deliverable by the USPS, but third parties can deliver to. So knowing that, and then choosing a delivery provider is a, an excellent example of how to build an, an immediate efficiency rather than worrying about is it deliverable or not. Um, or maybe you take the longitude and latitude from the address and you, you're able to plan a more efficient um, delivery route. Um, the same can be said for phone lines um, or phones. You know, If you're looking at compliance, for example, you need to know if it's a landline or a mobile because different rules apply. You need to know if it's imported and what data it's imported because there are rules around that. So just those those extended or augmented or appended details sort of are what we call secondary data beyond the, the core name, address, phone, and email. Um, those secondary data points really allow us to give you more information to make critical decisions on. Um, and it also allows us to go on to the next step, which is where we start to um, take those secondary data points, the main data points, and we start to cross connect them or cross compare them. And what we're really looking for is consistencies or inconsistencies. And that allows us to sort of flag things like, hey, um, Ashley said she's in Los Angeles, but her IP address says she's in Russia. Um, this might be an inconsistency that you should be concerned with in, in the world of fraud. Or um, it might be that um, their phone data doesn't line up with um, their, their, their mailing address. And so that also might be like, which address do you want us to use in this delivery? Um, those, those are some of the things that we get from that. But part of the, these comparing these um, data points is we also are able to um, score the consistencies or inconsistencies. So we're really able to sort of say, we have um, confidence that this is an accurate data set or this is an accurate customer um, profile. And so that really brings us to the last thing, which is the quality signals. And really what quality signals are uh, in a nutshell is um, our uh, you know, it is a certainty score, if you will, of, you know, each data point that we're evaluating. So we might be able to say the name gets 100% because it looks like an accurate name. The address is appears in the USPS. We're going to give that 100. Um, the email looks like it's from a, um, a free provider and it's it's a known malicious provider. So we're going to give that a 30 and so on and so forth. And um, if you use some of our more comprehensive services where all of those are incorporated into one service, we also give you an overall certainty score. So each one of those numeric values, those scores, are what you can use to sort of as the foundation to building out your business logic. Um, and those are the things that we're really looking at to create efficiency. So if you can do market segmentation on the fly because you have these critical data points and scores with it or fraud detection or compliance or whatever, the, the, this is where you're going to start to see real efficiencies built into it. Um, one of the things that I thought was really interesting um, that I will share with you is I think intuitively all of us know that good, accurate customer data is what we want. Um, but I, it was interesting as I was putting this together, I, I came across a survey from uh, of the data and analytics professionals. I mean, it really um, pulled the, these groups of experts and said, 
you know, what's what's the most important thing to you right now regarding um, your data, your customer data? And they really said, we want to make data dis data driven decisions. That's our goal. Three quarters of them, 77% of them said, that's our goal. Um, the, the irony of that is 70 of those same people pulled, 70% of them basically said, we don't trust our data. It's, we really struggle to have tr quality, uh, to, to trust the way of data quality um, solved. And so it's, just, it's sort of that juxtaposition or that uh, sort of coming together of those two or, or, or sort of that opposition of those two, which is very interesting. I think it's a, we all know we want it, but we're not always sure how to get it. And so customer data validation and some of the, and the tools that we're talking about today are certainly are one of the um, leading ways that you can do this and probably one of the biggest ways you can do that. So with that said, I know that Ashley has a poll that she wants to sort of put up here. Yes. So let me push this poll out. So it reads, are you validating and ensuring accurate customer data? Um, you have answers, yes, no, or, or I wish. Um, so it looks like some votes are coming in. We're kind of all across the board here. Um, looks like we have a few yeses, a few nos. Let me publish these. All right. Thanks, Sash. Yep. Mm -hmm. I mean, not surprising. Um, and I, I, um, I always think the yeses are the more, in, the nos are kind of inter are, are easier because it's like great. You need customer data validation um, at some level, uh, at some place in your business processes. But the yeses are always interesting because I think um, what we find with our, our customers and our prospects is um, they um, have some form of customer data validation, but they either have not. Um, expanded it to sort of help in other areas or, or maybe they don't know how, or um, maybe they're only doing a small data select of their customer data validation. So there's a lot of opportunity to, if you are doing it, to expand it and um, really see more, um, get more ROI on that that investment. Um, of course, the no's are a little bit easier to talk about, but the same applies. There's multiple ways within a business for customer data validation to be used. Um, but what it really comes down to for me, and we've been doing this for quite a while now, is what you want is to build trust in your data. You, you really want to be able to not worry about if I'm making a decision, is it based on faulty data? Is it based on faulty information? And that's where the real power of customer data validation comes from. It validates those name, address, phone, email, and IP, um, and it gives you confidence that it's, that it's accurate. Um, and also it gives you those other additional data points. And those other additional data points are things that you can key your decisions off of. And again, it's just gonna uh, um, engender, <coughs> excuse me, more trust, excuse me. Um, and these, you know, that is going to also give you these valuable insights. And those, those are gonna be the things that help boost your efficiencies. And so let's just talk about some of the operational efficiencies. <coughs> excuse me. Um, so first, um, as I said, having trust in the data is number one, and that's gonna allow you to make informed decisions. And so we, we're gonna talk about each of these in detail in a second here, um, but really those insights, the, those data points that you're looking at, you're gonna um, have data to make decisions with. <coughs> Excuse me again. Um, and we also have um, on here, it can operate, uh, optimize your marketing, your sales, your customer care efforts, basically anywhere, any place where you're, business is reaching out and contacting your customers or, or having communications with your customers. It's going to help increase engagements. It's going to give your teams more confidence in those engagements. Um, it's just going to lead to stronger ROIs and ROAs. Um, and then lastly, we'll touch on um, how it supports compliance and risk mitigation. And um, I think this is, um, it, it becomes pretty self-evident when we start to look at it. Um, and we'll just go through that in a second. So. So with that said, let's talk about how it helps inform business decisions. Now, this is a very, um, this is a broad topic. There's a lot of different ways. There's, depending on your use case, it really is going to come into um, where you need um, to have confidence in your data to make decisions. And so customer data validation is going to give you that validated data. It's going to give you those appended data points. Um, and it's kind of going to give you a comprehensive customer profile that you trust. Um, and that numeric score is really um, the key to this informed decision making. Uh, after you get all of that, those data points um, sort of and everything sort of figured out, um, and that's really going to allow those scores are really going to now you, allow you to build business logic around them. Um, that numeric value is what a developer needs, or what maybe your workflow needs in your CRMs or your uh, marketing um, automation platforms. And so you really need those data points, um, and so. Um, and even in compliance, you're going to look at um, those um, scores or those data points as um, are they risk 
um, or do we, do we need to evaluate them, evaluate them as risks, or are we comfortable moving them forward? So, um, so that's you know a, a, on a broad level, it's it's really about giving you data to make informed decisions, and so it's really going to be about where you apply um, or where you need to apply that um, that data to make your decisions. And so the, it could be so many different places. Maybe we can talk about those at the end here. Um, secondly, um, it's really going to help ensure critical customer communication. Um, making sure that you have um, an accurate phone number, an accurate email address, or an accurate mailing address um, are going to ensure that your teams can communicate with um, your customers. And so, you know, if we look at the customer care team, um, you know, this can go into the invoicing. Of course, we want to get invoicing into the hands of your customers as quickly and efficiently as possible, whether that's through email or mail. Um, the last thing you need to do is slow down that payment process, especially in, you know, sort of financials, um, you know, financially sort of uh, struggling times. Um, we want to be responsive in, in support. We want to keep our customers. So we really want to um, be able to respond to any of the messaging that they have. And again, um, having accurate contact data points is, is critical there. Um, we want to proactively reach out to people. So maybe we have critical communication like, hey, we're going to be doing maintenance on our server at this time. And we want to get that message in front of the, the people and in, in front of our customers. Um, and so we really want to be able to again, have confidence that we're not going to create customer service problems when we take on that server for maintenance and people didn't get that message because they, we didn't have accurate customer, um, accurate email in that case. Um, it's going to, uh, all of these things are going to make the customer feel like they're supported and it's going to improve customer retention, which is also going to lead to better feedback and better reviews um, for, for your business. Um, and so, you know, that is some of the ways that um, having accurate contact that customer information is going to help with customer care and marketing um it's really going into more of the um the the market you can use it for marketing segmentation um so you know maybe we want to do regional um, marketing or maybe there's some other key element that you want to focus on maybe it's uh you know people who use landlines maybe that's a, a marketing um segmentation you or a target marketing you want to do um and it allows us um one of the things that um, we know is that um, if you have the right name, and this, you know, if, if Ashley's name is spelled correctly, um, and I can personalize an email or a letter to her, that personalization alone um, increases contact rates or, or click through rates by about 20%, depending on the, the, the medium you go through, it can be anywhere from 15 to 22%. So um, just being able to confidently use personalization in your um, marketing materials is going to Im have an imp impact on their their uh, contact rates. Um, it's also going to help with lead nurturing. If you're doing any sort of drip campaigns or nurturing campaigns, you need to make sure they're getting there. And so having, again, accurate email emails um, emails as a contact point is going to be uh, critical. Um, and all of this, if you have those, is going to give your analytics and your reporting more veracity, more truth to them. Because when you start to pull out the fraud or the, the fake accounts or even just bogus or unlikely to respond accounts out of your data sets and you reduce that denominator, your data is going to look better. And now you're acting, um, if you're responding to whatever the data is telling you, you're, you're responding to what actual people are doing, not what half of the people are doing if half of your data set is bad. So um, it really helps um, sort of bubble up um, maybe what you're looking for in your analytics and reporting. Um, and then lastly, um, just sort of talking about the, the sort of the, the three major groups that are impacted around customer communication, sales, of course. Um, you know, a, a good sales team is really about relationship building. If they can't get a hold of people or if they can't confidently get a hold of people, um, it's going to be tough to do that. And um, this works in two ways. One, of course, it impacts if you can't talk to a customer, you can't sell them your product or your service. Um, and that is going to impact sales and marketing or sales specifically. Um, but it also impacts the sales team. When a sales team is you know, given a list of prospects to call and 25% of them, you can't, you get a, either a dead dial tone or you get an in, instant bounce back on the email because it's a bad email. That just starts to affect their esprit de corps, their confidence in reaching out to the next person. So um, it, it's really a multi, it has multi um, multiple impacts when we, you have bad customer co contact data. Um, and that leads to, they're not able to expand accounts, they're not able to upsell and cross sell. Um, of course, if you pull out the bad the bad stuff, it's going to increase their contact rates. It's going to increase their confidence. They're going to dial more. They're going to email more. They're going to personalize more because they're confident that they can. Um, and all of those things are going to decrease the sales cycle. They're going to help 
um, get the noise out of the way of people that either aren't going to respond, or at the very least, they're going to get their nose and yeses faster, potentially. Um, and that's going to reduce that churn and prospect in your prospects, um, that rate of churn in, for your prospects and your customers. So um, there's a lot in this. Um, and it really just comes down to, do I have accurate customer data? Is it scored in a way that I can um, uh, automate some of the processes here and really get you know, in the customer care thing, get what's what's salient in front of them and marketing, making sure that your campaigns are effective and in sales, it's making sure they can actually talk to prospects and customers. Um, so, and then the, the next thing I like to talk about is compliance. And so what we're seeing today is uh, just in a growth and expansion of data protection and privacy regulations. Um, and really the, um, the number one thing that I think is important to understand in, in um, about these regulations, and I don't have it on here, is it is now incumbent upon the business to maintain accurate customer records. Um, it's not up to the customer to let you know that they moved or that they changed their phone number. It's up to you to show that you're doing your best efforts to maintain accurate customer data because you need to be able to communicate to them if there's a breach in um, privacy or, or or whatever data or, or a data breach or something like that. And so it's most of these regulations now have flipped it to um, it's really um, on the business to maintain that record. So <clears throat> just having customer data validation in place um, in your business is a big check mark in that compliance box for for you and for your customers. Um, but you know beyond that, um, you know more specifically, how can it be used? Well, um, these regulations, there isn't a global regulation for privacy. So everybody is covered depending on where you live and who you're doing business is with and where you're doing business with them. They're all covered under different regulatory um, regula regulations, sorry. Um, and so you need to determine which laws apply to them based on the user location. For example, the GDPR is about the EU. Um, so if you're a US business doing business with something in the EU, EU, you need to know that the GDPR applies to them and how you treat their data, even though you're in the United States. Um, and so that's just a, a very simple example of sort of maintaining compliance based on location and knowing what laws apply. Um, another one is data residency. In sort of in the same vein, um, given the regulations, there are, certain, there are a number of rules that apply to how you manage and, and store their data. And so you need to know based on what which um, regulation is applied to them, how you need to treat their data. Um, so again, that's just another example of how you can use um, customer data validation here. Um, and of course, the same thing is, you know, when you're presenting the, the I agree to um, privacy or data protection or whatever um, consent forms, you really need to know which one you're presenting. So if you can build into your logic based on location, prevent this person, the GDPR one, oh, Ashley's in California, present her with the California one. Um, those are, you know, things that you can build into your logic that doesn't have to um, even be thought about once it's built in and automated, clearly creating an efficiency there. Um, the other thing that that um, when we start talking about moving data around, so if you think of the snowflakes and the Azures and stuff like that, if you're moving data um, between these platforms or um, even just between your own personal or your own business platforms, um, there are a number of rules that apply to what you can do and how you can move it. And it really is based on where it starts and where it goes. And this is all going to always tie back to the customer. Or you know, at least the origin or the origin part is going to tie back to the customer location, um, and then where you're moving it to may or may not depending on it. But um, so if you're moving like customer data from the U.S. to the EU, the GDPR um, um, regulations start to come into effect there uh, on U.S. customer data because you're basically saying this customer resides in the EU now. Um, you can also do um, more localized things like like I just mentioned. The California has its own very strict new um, you know, customer protection um, regulations and they're getting and they've actually released a second one uh, at the beginning of this year it's even more strict so you need to know that you need to know that this customer is in california versus i'm in portland oregon so I, it doesn't apply to me it's not as rigid um, and so maybe there, it allows you to do certain things that you can or can't do but more importantly you just need you want to present the right um, privacy um, regulation in front of that person for them to agree to and read read um, and so um, that allows that, you know, at the regional level versus the, at an international or, or national level. Um, and a lot of times what this really comes down to is auditing. Um, when I talk about, when I talked at the top of this about customer data validation sort of being a necessary component um, in the compliance world, as I said, it is, a, it is your responsibility as a business to maintain 
accurate customer records. And so by having a customer data validation service in place, that is basically showing the auditors you are doing you are using best practices to maintain the, the accurate customer data. And so it really does um, check that big box of auditing. It's not gonna it doesn't get it's not a free pass, but um, it certainly shows that you're serious about it, that you're doing what you can about it, you're kind of investing in it. Um, that, that's a big part of it um, when you're being audited. So um, in, an, in a nutshell, that is just one big check mark. And, and if you think about it as an efficiency check mark, um, not having to go through a lot more hoops to show that you're doing best practices because you can say I'm, you can point to this service um, is, is going to help sort of shorten that audit cycle. Um, so sort of in the same lines, you know, we start to, we start to think about, um, as we talked about at the top, um, you know, fraud is becoming more and more uh, of a, an impact on businesses. And so we really want to look prevent fraud. And we really want to sort of do that through risk assessment. Um, so one of the biggest ways that customer data validation can be used is looking at location. And so really we want to look at the IP of the incoming customer. And we want to make sure that it aligns with what the customer is saying, where the customer is saying they are. So again, if I use the example of Ashley in California, but our IP says she's in Russia, that's an immediate risk flag for us, you know, and we're going to score it really poorly. We're probably going to flag it as um, looks malicious or looks suspicious um, at, with a score. Um, and that's going to hopefully trigger some business logic on your side that says, you know, A, don't work with this customer or B, at least move it to customer care for a further review. Um, if you were issuing credit cards or something like that. I'm sure you've had that experience where you travel outside of your known area and your credit card gets suspended. This is kind of the same idea till um, the customer reaches out and says, nope, it's me, I'm really here. Um, and those are some of the things that you can do um, just based on that. And that's gonna help with um, sort of risk mitigation. Um, and then the other thing you can do sort of in the same vein is um, you can look at um, their account says that, they, you know, when they originally signed up and they said, uh, and they built their account, they said they were um, in um, California, um, but now they're they're um, saying their their device or whatever is saying they're somewhere else, and so that disconnect again again against location um, can be a flag. It doesn't have to be. Of course, people travel; they do all kinds of things. But you're going to look for patterns in that, um, and we flag some of those patterns with our tools and, and score it accordingly. Um, and and kind of in the same vein, we're looking at like where did they log in from last, and so. Um, now with mobile devices and, and stuff like that, again, I may have registered my account and, and my mailing address is in in Portland, Oregon, but my phone, I logged into my phone in my account and I'm in Toronto. Um, is that a problem? Don't know. Should we flag it for a review? Maybe. Um, and probably yes, and that because of that distance, especially if there's not a consistency of, of, of those two locations. So again, you can just build in some business logic to say, um, has this account shown up in Toronto more than once kind of thing or something like that. Um, and maybe if it hasn't, then this is the first time you flag it the next time um, you, you don't, for example. Um, another thing that happens with um, um, location specifically, and it doesn't always have to be about IP, is there's a number of known fraud hotspots in the world. You know, China, there's a number of locations in China and Russia um, and India that have um, that are very well known to be sort of the centers of fraud. Um, and so what you can do is identify those, whether it's through IP or through location, uh, other location devices, um, like your mobile um, phone and stuff like that, which again is IP. Um, you're gonna be able to flag saying, oh, this looks, you know, we're gonna flag to you, oh, this is from a fraud hotspot. And you're gonna wanna look at it and make business decisions based on that. Um, and that kind of goes hand in hand with what I just said, which is that the device location um, matching, which is basically saying, um, are they consistent? Are you you're saying where you are? Your device is saying that you're kind of in the same area. Great, check mark. Moving on. And I think not. All right, what should we do? Um, and that's again where your business logic can take over. Um, and again, keep in mind that this business logic is all automated. So um, that flag for review can be something that um, your business um, may not do. It may just say, nope, we're not going to do anything with this, or we're going to, you know, they're only at this level. Are we going to review it? So there's de degrees of this that you can sort of build into that logic to help you do with it. Um, the other thing, of course, is just true address verification. Um, when people create fake accounts, it, one of the hardest things for them to create legitimately is a real mailing address um, and get all of the elements right. You know, the the numeric value, the directions if there's an east, west, north, south, the street name, the street um, designation is the street road 
place, whatever. Um, if they're adding units, that those are hard to do. Um, city names can be troubling because they may not be the mailing city name. Um, and a state is not usually a problem, but and even zip. And so getting all of those to line up appropriately and, and correctly and create a real valid address um, is hard to hard to fake. And so what, what this allows us to do um, is really flag, hey, this looks like a made up address. This isn't a legitimate address. Um, and, and usually that's coupled with the IP is a little bit of a disconnect and stuff like that. So there's all these indicators that um, there's some sort of risk here that you want to acknowledge and potentially review. Um, so, and then um, I think lastly, uh, or not lastly, sorry, um, the other thing you're going to look at is, uh, is someone signing into the account in multiple locations at the same time? Um, this is a clear indicator of fraud, especially when you couple it with those fraud hotspots. What generally happens is your account is compromised or a fake account is created, and um, that fake account is sold out to malicious people. Um, malicious actors, um, and they will pretty much immediately act on that. And so if you start to see multiple locations being signed into and stuff like that, that simultaneous login or close to simultaneous, it doesn't mean within seconds, it could be within you know hours in different locations. Those are going to be, again, more risk flags for you to, um, to want to pay attention to. And that's, again, what you know, the customer data validation can sort of help present in a numeric way that can be then acted on. Um, automatically. Um, the last one's a little bit interesting for me. Um, CAPTCHA is really meant to stop bots from signing into things. So it's really meant to, you know, if you've ever done CAPTCHA, if you've ever had to identify the streetlights and, uh, you know, in the grid um, or, you know, click on the motorcycle a hundred times. Um, it's um, really meant to slow down computers or you know, automated bots from logging in there. So it slows us down too. Um, and that friction sometimes can be frustrating for a customer. So um, this sort of works in the inverse of what we're talking about. You want capture there for the bots, but you want to kind of, if you can, um, either remove it. And uh, there's different um, versions of CAPTCHA too, simpler ones and harder ones. Um, and so you could either present a different version um, of CAPTCHA or not present, present it at all. If the person coming to your site keeps coming from the same IP address and keeps having successful logins, it's like, okay, we know you're who you say you are at this IP. We're confident to, to remove the CAPTCHA because it's not going to be a bot. Um, and so that's one of the ways that maybe you can flip it around. And now it's more of a customer facing sort of benefit where, you know, we have full confidence that you who you say you are. We're not going to force you to go through caption and sort of experience this friction where you might fail and get frustrated and leave. Um, so um, that's kind of, um, you know, one, I, 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 it kind of goes against the other ones where it's not um, a risk flag. It's more of a, um, hey, we're com we're confident, we're comfortable. We know that we have accurate, we're confident in the data that we have about you that, that this is who you say you are. Um, so with that said, it's really about, harnessing that customer data validation. It's really about building the trust in your data um, that allows you to improve the operational efficiencies. It allows you to, you know, if the data that you have is accurate and it's scored in a way that is meaningful to you um, in your business practices, you can start to build those business logic and business rules around it and really start to automate a number of things that either aren't being automated or um, you don't have confidence to automate them because you don't trust the data yet. Um, and that's where customer data validation really comes in. And it gives you that, um, confidence and then, you know, which translates into a competitive edge. It's going to um, help you with, you know, financial um, sort of hardships potentially. I um, mean, really just help you to sort of excel in that business landscape. Um, so with that said, it's important to sort of say at the end here, we've been doing this for 20 years. We have a number of, um, we have, you know, over 3000 customers that have deployed in many different um sort of horizontals, if you will, um, in many different industries, um, customer data validation. And so we have seen pretty much all of it. I would love to see new stuff that's always exciting for us. But we can offer um, really good um, examples of how it's been deployed. We can offer um, excellent samples of, of, of code that you can use to build that the, the business logic around. Um, so there's a, lot of, there's a lot of different ways that we can sort of help you come to um, help you use customer data validation to build in some of these efficiencies and solutions. And that's really going to help you um, make good decisions and really get out of the way of things that can be automated. Um, so with that said, i um, love to hear some of your, maybe some of the problems you're running into. Um, and so I'll open up to some questions. Yeah. So we have um, a Q&A box uh, at the bottom of your screen. Um, so please feel free to put in some questions. Um, 
once we're waiting for those questions to come in, I do have some questions for you, Rob. Um, in the beginning of the uh, slide deck, you kind of touched briefly on uh, quality and certainty scores. Um, so I was hoping that you could uh, kind of explain the difference between the two scores. Sure. Um, well, it, it's a good question. Um, those are both outputs from our APIs. These, you know, when we talk about customer data validation, there are all the different APIs that um, that you would plug in and ingest the data from, and then we would do our um, validation and give you back your scores. And so there are two scores that we generally output. One is called a certainty score, and one is called a quality score. And the certainty score is a numeric value. It's really meant for the developers to use that numeric value to build business logic around. It's it's a much simpler thing to do. Um, if you have a score of 78, you know what to do with it, you know, and the usually our scores are zero to hundred. There are a couple exceptions in there, but, and so that gradation um, of, you know, zero to 50, zero, you know, 50 to 75 and maybe 76 to hundred, those um, scores are meaningful, but they're meaningful in di for different reasons for different people. So um, it's super important that you, um, when you look at that certainty score to say, okay, what is my business application here? Because here, a simple example is, if you're an email marketer um, and the score is under 50, it basically means you're not going to get the email delivered or it's highly unlikely the email is going to not be delivered. Um, so you're going to write logic that says, don't bother even putting this in my marketing um, campaigns section. Versus um, if you were doing um, a mailing campaign, a, a score of 50 doesn't mean it's not mailable. It just means it needed to be corrected a bit. So the business logic around that is different. So it's important to understand that the, that certainty score, that numeric value, um, depending on the use, has different meanings for different people versus the quality score, which is more of a, a human digestible way of understanding if it's um, a good lead or a good address or whatever. And that really comes down to, I mean, it's really as simple as, you know, good review reject i mean it's really that simple and that's all it's meant to do is to give everyone sort of a cursory um you know touch point to see if this if the if the data point's good or bad um so um, one's used for for developers to write business logic around and one is really just to give you a quick review of if it is it good or not great um another question uh how can customer data validation be used to create efficiencies it's a good question. It's kind of what we just talked about a little bit. Um, I, I can maybe give you a couple of examples of um, some of our customers. Um, mm -hmm. Let me think. Uh, well, we have a customer who, you know, a lot of a lot of our customers are are, are really in the B to B to B space. So they're they're either a middle person in in, in the business where they're um, managing someone's data or they're providing a service on top of someone else's data and, and stuff like that. So one of the examples I can think of is um, we have a cust we have our customer. Um, what they do is they take in vendor data, um, you know, so whether it's 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 their vendors provide consumer data to them, and they um, do, and our customer then will validate that data, um, clean it up, and they'll append our information. Plus, they are also appending some sec some some of their information, the value that, that they add, and then that data is provided to their customers um, downstream. Um, one of the things that's happened over time, they've been a customer for ours for quite a long time. And one of the things that's happened over time is the value of the data coming into them from their vendors has been so poor and they've been, and they, those vendors get compensated for that data that they've started to demand that their vendors use our services before they send the data to them. Um, that means that they're going to get good data in. They're going to only pay for good data to their vendors. Um, they're going to, uh, they still run our validation services against it because they have other needs for it. They want other data points that their vendors aren't going to worry about. Um, and then uh, their end product that they sell to their customers is so much more enriched and um, of higher quality um, that they're able to charge a premium for their, their services and, and the data that they sell. Um, so it, it became like, hey, we're going to help you get your data a little cleaner too. Hey, we recognize this as improving the value of our, of our, of our product, of our output. Um, and we're going to ask, and we're also overpaying for our um, sort of our raw materials, if you will, as it was coming in. So it became a, um, a win for everybody. And the, their vendors, their good vendors uh, who are giving good data benefited from it because they were, because the company was willing to pay more for good data as well. So it got, it sort of expanded everybody's um, abilities to do good business, essentially. Um, so, yeah, yeah thanks for answering those. Um, we will be, if anybody else has any other questions, 
please feel free to put them in the chat box. Um, we will be sending out an email uh, with this slide deck as well as a recording. Um, it will be on our website as well. Um, so thank you again for everybody joining us today. And thank you, Rob, for presenting on this topic. Um, we hope that you learned a lot. This is our uh, contact us page. Um, so please reach out if you have any questions that we didn't touch on um, in this webinar. But uh, other than that, thank you again for joining us and um, enjoy the rest of your day. Take care.